in progress. Yeah, can we start now? Aisha. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the fifth event of Bioprocess Engineering Week 2021, Universitas Brawijaya. Greetings to the Honorable Professor Iman Santoso as the Dean of Faculty of Agricultural Technology, Dr. Ahmad Adi Suryanto as the Head of Agricultural Engineering, Dr. Yusuf Bisono as the Head of Bioprocess Engineering Study Program. Also, our Honorable Special Guest, Dr. Thomas Butler, and all the Honorable Lectors in the Faculty of Agricultural Technology, and last but not least, all participants of Bioprocess Engineering Week. To begin our lecture today, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Aisha Putri Andriani. As the Master of Ceremony of the fifth event of Bioprocess Engineering Week with the theme Microalgae, Biotechnology, and Production. Dear Honorable Guests and Participants, before we start our main event, let's start this event with a prayer first so that the event will be going well. Prayer starts. Then, Okay, before going to our main event, let me introduce you to the rundown of, of this event. We will start with the opening, then welcome a speech from the Dean of Faculty of Agricultural Technology, photo session, moderator introduction, guest lecture by Dr. Thomas Butler, question and answer session, and the last one is closing and photo session. Before we go into our main event, I would like to remind all participants to pay attention to the rules. The rules, first, please register with your real name and email correctly. Second, before entering the Zoom meeting room, make sure you're already using the name in the format, name underscore institution. Third, during guest lectures, participants should turn off the microphone and can turn it on only when the moderator has invited them to ask. Fourth, Question could be asked via Zoom room chat or can be addressed directly with to the moderator. Fifth, attendance form and participant feedback form will be shared during the lecture. So, let's begin our first agenda today. Let us hear the welcoming speech of, from Professor Iman Santoso. From Professor Iman Santoso, time is yours. Um, thank you. For the MC, um, sorry. Uh, um, okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, the Honorable Speakers, Dr. Thomas Butler from Senelge, Netherlands, uh, Head of Department of Agricultural Engineering, Dr. Ahmad Adis, uh, Head of Study Program of Bioprocess Engineering, uh, Dr. Yusuf Hibisono, committees and all participants. I am glad that in this week, we have a number of international guest lectures, including the current event, which will discuss the topic on microalgae production technology in industrial perspective. Uh, microalga is the third generation we feel currently considered as the feasible and sustainable solution for the future energy demand. As we know, the revision of biofuel from microalga biomass has been widely researched in the past few decades. Some research results show that microalga is capable of producing around um, 60,000 liter oil per hectare that can generate more than 100,000 liter biodiesel per hectare which seemingly a promising transition over conventional fuel fuel. 
Ne fortress economic sustainability of commercial scale production of microalga biomass is still in shadow of doubt, especially the cultivation and harvesting process. So this topic and discussion is very interesting, and of course it is one of area uh, studied in bioprocess engineering study program. That's why I'm sure that. Today's discussion will be fruitful for all of us, not only as an academic perspective, but also in industrial perspective to support green and sustainable development. Again, thank you for Dr. Thomas as a speaker. We hope that this event can inspiring and support us to continue in collaborating further in the future. Next, we hope that can arrange time to formulate research collaboration and other collaborative activities, especially with bioprocess engineering study program. Thank you very much for everyone who contribute for discussion. Please enjoy with this event. Good afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Professor Imam, for the welcoming speech. Before we going to the next agenda, let's take a picture together. For OC, you can please take the picture for us. For all participants, please turn on your camera. Okay, in the count of three, say cheers. One, two, three. Okay, one more. One. Two, three. Okay, now I would like to introduce the moderator for today's session. Let's see the curriculum vitae of our moderator, Dr. Wahyu Nando, as a lecturer of Bioprocess Engineering Study Program. Dr. Wahyu Nando is bachelor degree from Bogor Agricultural University, major in BTEC in Biosystem Engineering, Magister degree from University of Queensland, Australia, major in Environmental Engineering, and Doctor degree from University of Sheffield, UK, major in Chemical and Biological Engineering. Dr. Wahyu Nanto also has done a lot of remarkable research, publication, and working experience. Please welcome Dr. Wahyu Nanto. Yeah, thank you. Uh... <laughs> Yes, thank you for the MC. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon and good morning for Tom the Netherlands. As I know it is still morning in there. And for everyone in Indonesia and Malaysia, uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, first of all, I need to welcome all participants uh, from Indonesia, from overseas, from probably there are some Malaysia and uh, other countries as well. Um, yeah, actually this talk is the fifth session of Bioprocess Engineering Week. Uh, this is an event uh, organized by our student in Ravijaya University. And uh, I'm happy to let you know that uh, today uh, in, this, in this session, we have Dr. Thomas Butler. He's a senior research scientist in Sinalge in, in Sinalge in Algem in the Netherlands. And he has a long experience of research uh, in microalgae uh, area, not only academically, but also industrial, uh, in industrial level. Uh, Dr. Thomas Butler, he received uh, his PhD degree from the University of Sheffield. <laughs> Uh, in with the topic of microalgae research as well. And before that, he did his master's degree in the University of Aberdeen, University of Aberdeen. I think it, is within, it was in cooperation with SAMS, Scottish Association for Marine uh, Science. And if you know, SAMS or Scottish Association for Marine Science is a leading research institution in UK, probably in Europe, uh, about research about uh, microalgae. So if probably you are interested to do some research about microalgae, there will be a lot of uh, research, there, there will be a lot of experts there. And it is great, uh, uh, really, really great research institution in microalgae. 
And uh, since 2020, Dr. Thomas Butler, he works for Sin Alge. Uh, and about his hobby, I think he loves traveling and scuba diving. And if I'm not mistaken, he's supposed to visit Indonesia July this year uh, for a project with Operation Wallace, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, exactly. But he canceled, yeah, he canceled it because of pandemic, probably next year when the pandemic finish just come. Okay, I'll take you around to Indonesia. <laughs> uh, okay, um, anything else I need to introduce uh, Dr. Tom? I think that's enough about him. Uh, actually, you see if it's quite long. So just to make a long story short, uh, now I invite Dr. Thomas Bato to start Presentation. Hey, Tom, the next 15 minutes is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Wahyu, for the invitation. So I had the pleasure of working with Wahyu at the University of Sheffield and learned a lot from him. It's very nice to meet you all here today and to have 117 participants, which is really great. Um, and I would also like to you know, thank you, Professor Imam, for the great introduction as well, and Aisha and uh, Yusuf as well for the welcome here. So what I would like to do is from my seven years experience in the industry, I would like to show from my origins as a, as a farmer, in a sense, how I've gone to microalgal biotechnology and how learning from Western Europe, these practices can easily be employed in Indonesia for a commercial business model. And that's part of what I'm doing at the company now. We're trying to give farmers an alternative business to something like coffee, tomatoes, or potatoes, something which is hopefully more profitable. So I will now share my screen with you. Just to confirm again, you can see the presentation. So the title, yeah, the title I was given uh, by Wahyu was about the sustainable production of microalgae for high value products and biofuels. So these are sort of some of the systems which we offer at a very small scale from uh, 25 liters all the way up to 30,000 liters and we're currently in the verge of doing two to three hectare projects. So I thought first, uh, well, Wahyu's already done that very well, a bit of background and experience about myself, a little bit about the algal revolution, so how it started in the 1950s going through till now. That'll be a very quick synopsis. A little bit about my PhD research, not too heavy on the academic sense and the research, but more about what we can learn from, from my PhD, some of the failings, some of the successes going forwards to help people in Indonesia. Uh, about setting up algae, not only uh, as a farm, but also how can they be incorporated into urban planning? So if you're having a building, a rooftop terrace, you can also grow microalgae there, which can capture the carbon dioxide and remove some pollutants. What are the future challenges to address? So as Professor Iman said, the problem will be for especially biofuels is the downstream processing. So there's a lot of you from a bioprocess engineering background, this is something really to focus on to bring the cost of production down. And finally, LGM Synology, the company I work for, what can we offer to, to help people? So my main passion, it lies in microalgae commercialization. Now, I, I like microalgae, they're really interesting, they're very beautiful, but they also have a function to help people in society. And that's what I really do believe in, that they're a sustainable source for future products, for ourselves, our families, and for future generations. So yeah, a little bit about the background, which I will go into a little bit more. So a variety of academic and industrial uh, experiences. And I think from working in both parts, it's really helped me um, to develop the skill set to now work in, in, in the company I'm in. And I was originally a marine biologist, but then I transitioned into the biotechnology. So. As Wahyu had said, it was my master's really, well, I was, I'll, let's say my passion first developed from a lecturer when I was doing marine biology, Dr. Gary, Gary Caldwell. He told me about microalgae, how they can produce biofuels and they can save the world. And I was really fascinated by this. So since then I thought, right, I really want to follow, you know, this career path. So that's when I did my master's in microalgae at the University of Aberdeen and the Scottish Association for Marine Science. And I was working on astaxanthin, which is a, a pigment a red pigment, and it's normally used for the salmon industry. Salmon would be gray without this pigment, and that's why it's absolutely critical for, for the industry. And it's also used as well for, 
for health benefits, anti-cancer compound. It's also used uh, for cardiovascular health. A lot of triathletes take it. And since then, I've continued along the high value products route, and that's what I did my PhD in. So really working towards a health product, fucosanthin for weight loss, and also this omega-3 fatty acid, which is also in fish, and that is uh, for, for cardiovascular health and um, you know, prevention of heart disease. So I will go into this a little bit more, more detail and why it might be of importance to you. So how this is relevant from my master's, it was a one-year research project looking at all different strains. So of Hamathococcus, there's around 80 different strains worldwide. So if you pick one species of Hamathococcus, why do you want to pick a particular strain? Well, it will grow really fast. It maybe can tolerate the climate of Indonesia. And it also has a high astaxanthin content. So I was bioprospecting. And actually, my professor at the time, Dr. Uh, professor John Day, he found an isolate in Germany in a bird bath. So simply by going in the garden, finding uh, a little red puddle, and there was hematococcus. So in amongst it was a load of other different algae, and I had to then isolate this, this strain. And actually, interestingly enough, some of these other strains, they're really red in color, produce a lot of astaxanthin. And I was specifically after this motile form because it's very difficult to disrupt the algae and extract the astaxanthin out. But this one has a very thin cell wall, so it actually bypasses that need for the disruption stage. And this is, is saving a lot of money in the process. So this is something which can, you can happen just by going outside. You can find a microalgae of interest and uh, sequence it, find out more about it, and then you can start working with that strain. And from my master's, I really developed a little bit of the, the work experience from algae sites. And algae sites, I was talking about this omega-3 fatty acid product, uh, icospentaenoic acid. And that's really what the company was working on. And this was back in 2014. And now the company, uh, well, two years ago, they expanded to 12,000 liters. And actually now they're actually building a demonstration facility in Germany, and then they're going to go commercial. But it shows this company started in the early 2000s, and it's now 2021. So this is not something where you will make money in the first few years. It's an investment of 20 years, maybe more. And a lot of millions were invested. But this will be an alternative product to fish. So it reduces the need for overfishing in the oceans, and you're producing a sustainable plant-based omega-3 fatty acid. And at the time when I was working for this company, it was a bit revolutionary. They had this flat plate bioreactor, which was a continuous system, and the only continuous system in Europe at the time. So it's quite a groundbreaking company. And the importance as well is starting at the small scale. So don't just go big and build a big system. You need to know what you're doing and uh, you know, understand your algae very well. What are the products it's producing? Have some stability. So here we have this multi-cultivator system, which essentially is a series of tubes where you can control different, uh, compare different conditions. And then we go to a scaled one liter system before you would then adopt that into the 1200 liter pilot plant system. And after algae sites my master's, I then worked with Algenuity. Some of you might have heard of this company in the UK. If you haven't, then please do follow it because this is a really revolutionary company. When I was working there, it was a lot about understanding microalgae, screening different strains, understanding what products they can produce for society. We were also working on a lot of genetic engineering, but the problem with, with the genetic engineering is the regulatory hurdles. It might be different in Indonesia, but in the UK, and the European Union, it's very, very difficult to bring a new product to market, which is genetically engineered. So this was several years of research projects, but it was not really commercially relevant. Whereas now, they're actually producing something called chlorella colors. And if you taste an algae, it's often bitter because of the chlorophyll. But algenuity have found a way to remove that chlorophyll or to at least reduce it. So now you can have this chlorella which is white powder or yellow powder, and can be used as a protein replacement as an alternative to meat. So it's really a vegetarian alternative. And here they're producing it in fermenters with heterotrophic cultivation, but it's really proving to be a profitable enterprise. And Algenius is quite a small company, but they've now partnered with Unilever, which of course is known globally. So it's a really, uh, a company which is up and coming, and I really would follow them. It's a very important one to follow. Uh, so this is also what they, they sell. They sell a, uh, an Algen system, which uh, it 
what, what you can do is it's essentially two one liter flasks and you can compare two treatments. So let's say I want to compare the Netherlands, growing microalgae in the Netherlands with growing microalgae in Indonesia. I can do that. Based upon NASA modeling, you can actually have the same climate. So you can also see before you scale up a facility, what would happen in the small scale? So what would happen at increased temperatures? Or what would happen if there's more cloud cover? You can really model these things. And that's the really interesting part about this technology. And then after so doing my, my bachelor's uh, so my master's and then working at Algenuity, I then did a small placement with Vericon Aqua Solutions Limited. So they produce uh, a lot of photobioreactors, again, at scale. They're actually a competitor of Elgem Synology. So they both produce good systems, but I'm a bit biased. And what Elgem Synology do, we do produce uh, better, better systems in a sense. There's less fouling, we can run the systems for longer. But what I want to explain here is I help them set up a lab. Now, the laboratory, you probably have better laboratories in Indonesia, but I was working in a warehouse. So I had to create a lab from a warehouse. So first installing your cupboards, then you need some critical pieces of equipment, so balances, uh, some small photobioreactors, an incubator to grow the algae, a spectrophotometer, and bit by bit, you can build it up. But this really cost around 3,000 euros to set up a whole laboratory with everything. And not by going to expensive companies, I won't mention the names of the pharma companies, but by simply getting, lab um, what, how do you call it? Cooking equipment, so saucepans, heating them up to then sterilize your media. Simple things like this, so just by using some ingenuity. And here I was also helping to build bioreactor systems. And this is when I was learning more about the reactors and, and how these tubular reactors especially are the way to go forwards, which I will emphasize a lot more. So these are some of the systems, and again, they're operating at the largest scale as well. So you have the FICO flow, the biofence, and the FICO lift, which is an air lift bioreactor. So depending on your algae, depending on your needs, uh, it will dictate what system you want to choose. And then, as Wahyu had said, since 2020, I've been working with Synalgy. And why it's a bit complicated, because it is Synalgy, but we went through a merger. So Synalgy is a microalgae producer. They're a grower. Actually, the owner of the company was a rose grower. And he got fascinated by microalgae and how they could uh, make more money and, uh, again, solve problems in society. So it started with Synalgy, and Elgem has 16 years of experience in photobioreactor manufacturing. So we brought the companies together, forming Elgem Synalgy. So in the first year, I was trying to build a business case for a specific microalga of interest, nanochloropsis, which some of you might know. And again, the business case was for the omega-3 icosapentaenoic acid. And we were sort of building the business case on a one hectare scale. So to produce the cost of microalgae, it's around 20 euros per kilogram. But to sell it, it's maybe 40 to 50 euros per kilo. So the, the, the selling price is not so much and the cost of production is very high. But the major cost of production is due to labor. Labor cost, so we're trying to automate things. And this is why our partnership between Elgem, Synalgy, and an engineering firm, Bossman and Zoll, is then making these things possible. So what I would like to do is to actually share a video with you now uh, to showcase about the company uh, and what, what we do. Share sound as I can wait. So just to confirm, you can see the video. Yeah, I can see the video. And you, and you can hear it as well. Yeah. Yeah, I can hear it. Hello, my name is Sander Haaswinkel. Allow me to introduce you to our newest LGM LG Hub. Here we can demonstrate and share a look and feel of our newest LG technologies. LGM is able to deliver worldwide LG solutions to any scale. Our teams offers expertise 
in planning, realization and engineering that is needed for complete and successful LG projects. The LGM Hub delivers our customers much needed testing capacity. In our view, a must have in any scale up aspiration. Testing is supervised and executed by an expert team or with the customer's own operators. It's Elgem's goal to deliver the best solutions and to lower our customers' investment risk. Good preparation and assistance will give our customers the best possible start of their operation. Behind me, you can see the long-time operational and trusted Elgem systems, but then in a totally new upgrade. These systems offer some huge advantages what make them the best the industry can get. All of our systems are equipped with our proprietary bubble brush and wave wind technology. These allow our systems to operate without biofouling and at a super stable pH. LGM systems have the lowest energy demand of any tubular photobioreactor system available. LGM's newest generation systems are fully automated and seamlessly integrated in an up and downstream process. Integration and automation makes growing algae much more effortless. The new AI modules will aid in a much faster improvement and higher yields. Our photobioreactors range from 25 liters to 45,000 liters and can be delivered integrated in a complete project. We are ready to assist you. So I hope you're feeling inspired by that. And that's something which we can bring to Indonesia. Uh, and it's, it's just a matter really of, of bringing the glass over and the steel construction and setting up the facility. But this is the thing as well, it depends. In the Netherlands, it's a matter of labor is very expensive, so therefore you want to automate it. But in Indonesia, you can lower the cost of the uh, bioreactor installation and actually employ more people. So it's actually also a way to employ members of the community. So this is not a matter of removing labor. It's more a matter of getting rid of me in the Netherlands. But in reality, in uh, Indonesia, it's, it's really going to create a lot of jobs. So the reactor experience, and this is what I want to, to really share to all of you as well, to learn from my mistakes and the industry's mistakes. A lot of people are using open pond systems or airlift bioreactors or tubular reactors or flat panel reactors. But what really is the optimal one? And I mean, I've worked with all of them. Open ponds, the limitation is they're open. So you get birds which will go to the toilet in the ponds it's not clean and the the productivities are very low flat panel bar reactors they're a nightmare to clean it's extremely difficult to clean them and your production runs are very short airlift bar reactors they have their own limitations as well with fouling so you get algae build up on here and fermenters can also be useful but they're very expensive to buy and you're really defeating the object of an alga which is to use light not to grow them heterotrophically on a carbon source. It is possible and you can achieve very high concentrations. So if we compare, remember these figures. In an open pond, you can achieve one gram per liter dry weight. In a photobioreactor at Elgin Synology, you can achieve up to eight grams per liter dry weight. And in a fermenter, you can achieve 110 grams per liter dry weight. And the productivities there in an open pond might be 0.1 grams per liter per day. In a photobioreactor, it can be from 0 0.4 to 2.5 grams per liter per day. And then in a fermenter, you're talking up to 5 grams per liter per day. So what we're doing here at Elgem Synology, and why I want to show you the video, is there's three different systems. One is a vertical system, and two are horizontal systems with different, space, uh, different spaces between the tubes. And we're trying to identify what is the best, best system. Now, this will depend, of course, on the cost of land. So if the cost of land is very expensive, you want to build a vertical system. But if land is cheap and you want to uh, have uh, high growth rates, then you might want to choose the, the horizontal bioreactor. Now, we offer the flexibility to the customer, whatever they would like. But I can tell you now, out of everything, tubular reactors are the way. 
because this system here, we have running for 320 days. Now that's unique. Most companies will have a system running for around two months and then it collapses due to contamination. But we have 320 days. And they're a pleasure to work with these systems. They're very easy, control panel, just press things, press a button to harvest the culture, press a button to then dewater, and then we will outsource to for the cell disruption and extraction. So I really like these systems. And some of this information is covered if you would like to read in some of the, the publications I have. So some are a mixture more about microalgae in the academic side, and some are more about the industrial side. So if you want to start your own microalgae business, uh, then there is some information in there, and I'm happy to share these book chapters with you. And it's drawn a lot of knowledge from a lot of people I've worked with. So people from China, from Pakistan, from the UK. Uh, it's been a really multidisciplinary approach, biologists, engineers, geneticists. And that's the thing. It's a team which makes something successful. It works here at LGM Synology because we work as a team. It's not one individual. It's the whole thing, the marketing, the production side, the research and development. And we work well together as a team. And also something I shared as well with Wahyu, which might be of interest as well, is a little bit more about microalgae, what products can they produce, and how can they help in society? And this is something which might be useful for in schools and also for uh, helping people of the general public. So really, I don't know everybody's knowledge. Some, some will differ. Some people will know more about microalgae than me. Some people might not know much at all. But, you know, microalgae are very small plants, which are on the micron level. And... At the end of the day, what are microalgae competing with? Well, it's bacteria, yeast, mammalian cells for pharmaceuticals and, uh, you know, for biofuels. And it has to be something which is cost competitive. Otherwise, why use microalgae? And the fact as well with microalgae is that they're really interesting because like plants are, you know, uh, avoiding the need of, of palm oil, which results in deforestation. Microalgae can build built on existing infrastructure. They don't need fertile soil, so you're not going to degrade your soil. And they take up a lot of carbon dioxide. So as part of the, uh, the climate change, we need to have ways to capture carbon. And you're capturing that carbon, but you're not just burying it underground. You are producing interesting products of interest to really benefit people. And whereas a crop you harvest once a year or maybe twice a year, microalgae, we harvest every day. And that's the amazing part of it. So you're getting money every day. And at the moment, we're not using any pesticides or herbicides. So it's a pretty clean process as well. So these, again, are all the different systems which have been trialed. You have Cyanotech in Hawaii, which is very well known. You've got BASF in Australia, producing beta carotene, which is dominating that market. You've got spirulina ponds in France, uh, Alga Technologies in Israel. And then here you've got some carbon capture biofuel schemes. And this, I think, was um, yeah, for biofuels, maybe Solana Energy. So again, always choose tubular reactors. That's what Israel do. Alga Technologies are doing it, and it works very well. So yeah, there's 30,000 species of microalgae in the world. There's a lot, maybe more. They're found practically everywhere on Earth. But only a few species have been studied in depth to date. And they're the ones I will go through. But it's not limited to these species. Try find something unique, which everybody wants. What do people want to buy? What do they need? In the West, it's a matter of, People want to look good. We need cosmetics. Um, we want to uh, lose, lose weight. So therefore, these products are interesting. So that's why I want to emphasize a lot more about, from my PhD, what might be in interesting for Indonesia. But spirulina is the major one which everybody will know. You buy it in uh, the supermarket and capsules. The selling price here in Europe is a little bit more, but the selling price, for instance, in China or India is, is a lot lower. So the biomass, it's only 8 to $10 per kilo dry weight. But actually, the cost of production is similar to that. So it's not really a profitable business model. But it is something you can grow at home. Everybody can grow it. Uh, it's very easy to grow. It grows in alkaline conditions. And it doesn't really get contaminated. And you can produce this very interesting blue product called phycocyanin. And depending upon the grade of that, that can be very valuable. So if you have a very pure phycocyanin, it can be worth a lot of money. Then we've got nanochloropsis, which most people know as well. So again, an omega-3 producer. It's often fed for aquaculture, so sea bream, rotifers, and uh, then there's also uh, sea bass, so these kind of things. And again, many people have, inter have been interested for biodiesel as well. If you are going to go down the biodiesel route, then I would suggest to choose nanochloropsis. It is a very good oil producer. Around 20 to 40% of that cell is oil. 
and it is the best one to date. Either chlorella or nanochloropsis. But the problem is the downstream processing. It's very difficult to extract. It has this thick cell wall, which has an algene in the cell wall, and it's so much energy to disrupt it. So it's better off producing an algae, which maybe has a lower oil content, but it's easy to disrupt and extract. Then chlorella vulgaris is the other one. And this is, again, follow allogeneity because they have this chlorella colors. So this is the normal color of chlorella vulgaris. But without the chlorophyll, it turns white. And then you can also elevate the content of beta carotene to make it orange. And this is a real game-changing technology. And this is going to be available in supermarkets, a lot of places to put it into burgers and other food products, which I think is really fascinating because I've also changed my diet. I used to be a full meat eater and now five times a week I'm vegetarian. So I'm always looking for alternative vegetarian products, which are at a reasonable price. And this is really, really interesting. Then something else which is interesting is Senodesmus. So if you want to clean up the water, uh, there's a lot of nitrate or phosphate runoff from, from farming. Senodesmus is a very good algae for removing these pollutants. And the same thing as other, other pollutants as well. So uh, pharmaceutical waste, something, uh, contraceptive pills, these are also, it's a great algae which can remove them. The big problem is with Senodesmus, what do you do at the end of it? Because you produce all this biomass, but is it worth money? So for biofuels, maybe it is, but it doesn't really produce a lot of other interesting products. That's, that's the thing which needs to be worked on more. And then the algae, which I'm really, really passionate about, and I think is one of the most beautiful algae, is Hematococcus. So it starts out as this little green algae, which produces a lot of lutein, which is a very important pigment uh, for eye health, for ocular health. So it can prevent macular degeneration and cataracts. And it's also now being used as a treatment. Now, the only source of lutein today is the marigold flower, actually. And that's very labor intensive. You have to pick the lutein out of the petals. Whereas microalgae can produce around 2% dry weight of the biomass as lutein. And if you stress the alga, this is very fascinating. You stress it under high light and uh, depleted of nitrate, and it turns bright red. Then the lutein converts through to astaxanthin, and then that gives you that beautiful red pigment. And why it's so important is that of the salmon industry, of the food cost for the salmon, 20 to 25% of the cost is astaxanthin. The farmers don't want to put it in, but as I said before, the salmon will not be red, it will be gray, and nobody wants to eat a gray fish as a salmon. So that's why they need this pigment. It used to be worth $100,000 a kilo, and then it reduced to around $7,000 a kilo, but now there's over 30 companies operating worldwide, and that's why the price, of the cost of production has decreased to 2,000. So what I'd like to explain to you all as well, is just because a product has a high selling price, it doesn't mean it will be the same in 10 years time. So be careful, make sure you know what the customer wants, what they're willing to pay for it, and then go down that route as well. And something else which is really interesting, which I've been working on recently, in a different algae, but is uh, Fica erythrin. It's this beautiful pinkish pigment. And this again is produced in uh, the chloroplast of the cells in, uh, in the thylakoid. And uh, yeah, a really high purity. Uh, maybe this is 70% purity, but you can get over $10,000 per kilo. So it's a really high value product. And this porphyridium, it grows very well, actually. It's a very good algae. It's a saltwater one, so very interesting. Dunoliella has been studied for a very long time, yeah, since at least the 70s, maybe the 80s. And this is, again, it's a very interesting algae. Like spirulina, it's an extremophile. Spirulina grows at high pH, a lot of bicarbonate, excluding contaminants. Dunoliella grows at a very high salt concentration, which also excludes other contaminants, such as the brine shrimps um, or other grazers. So it's a really interesting one. But at the moment, most people produce Dunoliella in a pond. And you have to be very careful with Dunoliella because it has these flagella. And if you just grow it in a normal uh, tubular system with a closed impeller pump, you will break the cells. So one day it will be a beautiful orange color and the next day it's all dead. So you need to have only an air pump. And we have experience with this at LGN Synology, so we can design the system for you, tailor-made to your algae of interest. And another little baby, which I'm really interested in, is Fairdactylum. So this produces uh, the icosapentaenoic acid, fugazanthin for weight loss, and uh, it's also of interest to biodiesel. So if you want to produce biodiesel, also produce high-value products as well to add value to your business case. 
but there are also many other uh, possible products of interest as well. So this is currently being produced in um, uh, Simris, which is based in uh, Sweden at the moment. And also to show you, we have these big farms, which you can also do one hectare, five hectares. Some people say you can go to 100 hectares. The biggest facility, I think, at the moment is maybe around 40 hectares in China. Um, but normal facilities will be more around the one hectare mark. But you can also start something smaller at home. So, you know, start with a little small open pond, see how the algae grow, what they like, what they don't like. And you can grow this on top. And it, it's also spirulina is a way, it's 70% protein. So it's a way to solve malnutrition. Uh, people who are in poverty, it is a way to bring people out of poverty. It's a superfood for the future. So this is something which everybody can do. So that's why I won't dwell too much upon this, but it's more the, the theoretical ideas of what where algae could be produced. And, and there are some actual case studies. Uh, so yeah, in Singapore, uh, we have Hong Kong. And something which is really interesting is also in Hamburg in Germany. This was also one where they were looking at microalgae for biofuels and then the biogas, the energy would be used to heat the building for people to work in it. So it was a photosynthesizing building. This actually happened in 2013, really interesting. And in Thailand, it is a hotel, but now they're growing spirulina on the roof. And the spirulina, they're now uh, from the top, they're taking carbon dioxide from the cities and they're putting it into the restaurant industry. So again, really, really insightful work going on here. And again, this is a really useful paper uh, to look at, you know, what photobiorector are you going to choose? Like I said, tubular systems I would recommend. You know, how much carbon dioxide will the systems take up? What are your uh, productivities? What's the business case? It's important to read the academic literature and to chat to as many people as possible before you start that business. And universities play a vital role. So it's so important that industry and academia collaborate together because academics can really do a lot of research, which will help your business. And it's so important to provide the funding from industry to the universities. So actually, when I was working with some architects, this is also what we did. We, we selected chlorella as an algae. Uh, we built out some of the design, how we wanted to incorporate these algae into Sheffield. And then uh, it ended up to be a bit more kind of like this design. So this is a, a living, breathing uh, vessel, again, taking up carbon dioxide. But again, the problem which we came to was what do you do with the biomass afterwards? You know, uh, you have to think about this. But, but this is also the thing and what's happening in the Netherlands now. It's coupling agriculture together as well. So can you grow microalgae as a vertical farm above your crops? And then could the microalgae be then fed to the, the cows? So cows produce a lot of methane. But there's been studies now where if you feed microalgae to cows, they produce less methane. So less greenhouse gases are released into the atmosphere. And I think a lot of you will be asking about, you know, can you produce biodiesel for microalgae? Personally, I've been looking at this since 2014. I'm really interested in it, but it's been so much research since the 50s, 1950s, 1970s, Japan, the US, Europe, everywhere. And the companies which might do it is ExxonMobil and Synthetic Genomics. So through genetic engineering, they're producing algae with a higher oil content. And they predict by 2025, they can produce 10,000 barrels of oil per day. But that's such a small amount of the amount of oil that is produced globally. And you have to think there are many companies which have gone bankrupt. Solana, Sapphire Energy, Solozyme, it's rebranded as Terravaya. All these companies investigated oil. Solozyme was even providing oil for the US Navy. But you can't make money from biodiesel alone. You have to produce high value products of interest as well. So I'm going to show you that business case with Fed Aflum and how you can produce fucosanthin and EPA. So this is more about the pathway of algae to show how complex it is. And that's why researchers are needed really to look into this side of work. But Fed Aflum is very interesting because it's really well known as the pathways and what products it produces. So you've got the lipid fraction, the pigments, the carbohydrates. It can produce bioplastics through genetic engineering. And also the biomass can be fed directly to fish, fish, oysters, mussels. It's a really interesting algae. And why EPA? Well, as I say, it's omega-3 fatty acids. And in, in Western diets, there's a big problem of obesity. In the UK alone, around six in 10 people are considered obese. So there really is a need for, for uh, weight loss compounds and, and also to prevent uh, 
heart disease. So that's why EPA is particularly of interest. This is the pathway again showing how it uh, originates. And why fucosanthin? Fucosanthin should be our key product of interest in a, in a biorefinery idea. Fucosanthin is the highest value product, and then followed by EPA and then biodiesel. And again, it's mainly used in weight loss, but also as an antioxidant. And it also is potentially uh, an anti cancer compound. So, again, the pathway here. And these are commercial case studies. So, if you think since the 1970s, people have been studying phenatalum, only two companies exist one is the production of EPA, and one the production of fucosanthin. But you can learn from these companies to apply something to Indonesia. And also, again, look at the academic literature and see. So, for instance, if we look, at a techno-economic assessment, evaluating the business case for EPA alone, you'll see that the cost price is $400 a kilo and the selling price is $500 a kilo, mainly because of the purification costs. And this is, this is things which need to be streamlined. We need to replace centrifuges with cheaper alternatives. With dewatering, we need to look at uh, cost-effective approaches and also how to purify that omega-3 fatty acid without using toxic solvents. These are things which need to be solved. That's why I was focusing on in my PhD was a lot of the bottlenecks, upstream processing, in progress. that culture, and look into this. And simply by increasing the nitrate and phosphate, you can increase your fucosanthin content quite considerably. And then the same with the protein. And this leads to a higher value biomass. People are more interested because it has products which are of value. And simply by increasing the nitrate and phosphate content and optimal salinity, supplying more carbon dioxide and using mixotrophy. So you could use glycerol, glucose, acetate. But for me, glycerol was optimal for pterodactylum. You could have a ninefold improvement in biomass productivity and the products of interest. So these are simple experiments which can be conducted. Not a lot of work. And you can really get an interesting uh, product. And also, a lot of people investigate as well about light. You know, what is the optimal light for microalgae? Sunlight is great. But if you don't have a lot of light at the night, you need to give them more light to avoid photorespiration, so you will actually have biomass losses. So during the day, the algae are photosynthesizing, they're growing. But at night time, they then start to use up those reserves of carbohydrate and then lipids. So you will result in a lower biomass productivity. So during the night, you need to supply light. And red-blue light is a cheap way of supplying that light. I'm not saying red-blue light will work in all cases. Some algae don't like it, but most do grow very well under it, especially the green algae. And use light-emitting diodes, the LEDs. Don't use fluorescent bulbs or halide bulbs. They're, uh, they're cheaper to buy initially, but they, they're more expensive to replace. And they're more, the cost of electricity is much higher as well. So LEDs are always the way. And again, this is important as well. I did some research on what is the optimal strain. I worked for three years with one particular strain, but it wasn't the best strain for producing products of interest. I later found two other strains which performed much better than the strain I initially thought. So before you do research at big scale, start small, choose the correct strain, understand it very well, and then scale up. And this is also showing here, so with the red, blue light, depends on the product of interest. But generally speaking, you're resulting in much higher productivities of your, your compounds of interest. Something else to discuss, not too much on the technical side, but develop your methods. If you want a product of interest, understand how to extract that product. I can share these protocols with you uh, to, to help save you time. And, and this is something which I always find is it, it, it can, you can spend a lot of time on this area. So I've been working on fugazanthin detection. And this is where you need expensive equipment to analyze. But it might be that you can actually, as a farmer, you can outsource this. You don't have to pay for all the analysis yourself or do it in-house. Get somebody else as a third party to analyze it for you. This is, this is what we're doing now, actually. Because this HPLC here could maybe cost around 10 to 20,000 euros. You're not going to have that money as a startup. So outsource it. Focus on the growing the algae. Let somebody else deal with this. The same as the fatty acids. Again, expensive equipment, a lot of method development is needed to do this. And I developed actually a method. Um, my colleague originally had developed a method, and then I, I did some extra work on it. But essentially, by avoiding cell disruption and extraction, you can do a direct transesterification, which is converting 
the lipids to uh, oils of interest. And this is something which can be scaled up as a process for biodiesel. Then again, there's a multi-assay as well. If you, if you do want to do things in-house, this is quite a cheap method, actually. So it's developed by a guy in my research group from China, Yun and Chen. And he worked out how to identify the chlorophyll, carotenoids, protein, carbohydrate, and lipids all in one multi-assay. And it only takes 24 hours to have everything. It's a really interesting method. So what are the bottlenecks for ensuring a successful microalgae business case? Biofouling, that is one of them for sure. Like I say, after one month, two months, you will get this fouling, which will build built up. Contamination will come, your grazers will start eating your microalgae, and your cultures will collapse. So don't waste time like I did on these flat panel bioreactors. Go for tubular reactors. Here at LGM Synology, we have a unique pigging technology, so we can clean the systems in between the runs. We have the option of steam sterilization to sterilize the systems. We also have a successful method of chemical treatment. And this has enabled us to have 320 days of cultivation. Also downstream processing, that is just absolutely critical to work on. Uh, and it's not an easy method, not one case fits all, but the harvesting, the cell disruption, the extraction, it needs to be focused on. And I hope to give you some words of wisdom really here about what to explore and to do further work on. But you know, where are we in terms of cost of production? I don't know what the cost of microalgae is, well, the, the selling price of microalgae in Indonesia, but maybe here in the Netherlands, you could sell it for 50 to 100 euros a kilo. But the cost of production is 330 euros per kilo dry weight if you have 25 meters squared. If you go to one hectare, that's 40 euros per kilo. If you go to 100 hectares, which is huge, that's three euros per kilo. So you're more likely going to be at the business case of 40 euros per kilo here. But if you have cheaper labor, uh, some automation based there, then maybe the cost of production is cheaper. Some people are actually in India are producing algae at around 20 euros per kilo. This is something to focus on. So the harvesting, yeah. If you look at the whole cost of the production process, harvesting, cell disruption, extraction, purification, that's 50 to 60% of the whole production cost. So it's, it's a lot that needs to be focused on. And the harvesting alone is 20 30% of the cost. You need to ensure that your harvesting method is not going to degrade your product. You need to ensure it's not toxic uh, and it's quick. Because over time, if you're processing your biomass over several hours in the Indonesian sun, your product is going to get degraded. Your pigments will degrade. Uh, oxygen will, will uh, uh, rapidly spoil your algae. So it needs to be very quick. And you have to concentrate that biomass from around 1 to 5 grams per liter all the way up to 200 grams per liter. And that's a lot. So the only technologies which do work, there are others, of course, but these ones work for sure. Bio-based flocculation, centrifugation, but it is very expensive, and membrane filtration. So dewatering through centrifugation. Here we have all these technologies at Algen Synology. We have a Hair Westphalia disc stack, which will give you a good quality product, but it's not suitable for all algae. Some of them, the, the algae cells will be disrupted. You have an Evoldus. Uh, spiral plate technology, which works very well. Uh, but again, the, the processing capacity is, is more limited. And maybe after uh, a few hundred liters, you have to then clean the system again. Then we have tubular bowl systems, uh, which are also very good. And we have this membrane filtration technology, which you can leave for 12 to 14 hours running, and your product is then uh, delivered. And this is a very successful technology, and it's low operating costs. And I was working during my PhD on a bio-based flocculant. And again, you can see the slides afterwards, but just to summarize, I worked on this product called Tanfloc. And it's from tannic acid, which is actually from a, an acacia tree. And it uses a successful flocculant for charge neutralization to sediment the algae. And it can occur as simple as just 10 minutes. So you put the algae in a tank, and after 10 minutes, the cells are harvested. For drying technologies, what should you use? Don't investigate them all. I've already done that at the company. And freeze drying will give you your best quality products. Spray drying and drum drying are your most economical methods in terms of capital expenditure and operating expenditure. So these three technologies should be a given. If you want a cheap technology, choose solar drying, just rely on the sun, but it takes a very long time 
and your product is degrading because it's heating up. So freeze drying will give the best quality product. Cell disruption and extraction. Uh, you can choose to disrupt the cells before or after drying. If you do it before, the drying process might degrade the product, so you have to be careful. But if it's a, a wet processing method, then I would choose uh, bead beating. But you have to be careful with uh, the, the bead beating, bead milling, because you have heat generation, so that also degrades your products of interest. And also, you, sometimes the beads can fragment, so you have beads in your product, which is not very good if it's for human consumption. For biodiesel, it's no problem. But these are things you really have to think about. And for the food industry, people are using supercritical carbon dioxide or pressurized liquid extraction. These are things you have to, you know, think about the product, about the selling price, and decide what you want to do. And contamination. You will have contamination during your cultivation. At Elgin Synology, we can manage this. Um, it's not easy to get rid of the contaminants. It's best to prevent them. So by doing hygienic cultivation, cleaning your systems very well before use, keeping the system closed, you will avoid these contaminants. This is something maybe it's also a bit short of time, but we, you can uh, look at at your own leisure. It's certain universities which deal with this contamination. So start collaborations with different universities. And this is something as a, you know, as a, as a whole process, what I envision you could do from fair back to them. So by harvesting, first by bio-based flocculation to dewater with a cheap flocculant, then use membrane filtration, then you can disrupt the cells and extract it, perhaps with microwave-assisted extraction. You produce your high-value product of fugazanthin, which can be used as a nutraceutical for weight loss. And the biomass which is remaining will then be rich in icosapentaenoic acid, protein, carbohydrate, and minerals. And you can use that for aquafeed formulation, or you can use the fatty acids for biodiesel. These are the, you know, the potential options. It really is possible. And this is a business case which we developed at Elgen uh, over last year for a one hectare scale. So again, we have proven technology, 16 years in the business, Elgen, and, and know, you know, know what we're doing. So we can get really high balance concentrations, high productivities. We know all different fra fragile species. We've grown over 20 different species of algae in our systems, and uh, it works very well. So this was the business case for icosapentaenoic acid which we've proven, but it is still an expensive cost of production. So at a one hectare facility, it'll cost around 20 euros per kilo for uh, the biomass, and maybe 400 to 500 euros per kilo for the EPA. So alone, just by producing EPA, you won't make money, but it's something worth investigating. So the company is always ready to assist you. And please uh, feel free to ask any okay, thank you. So much. Uh, it's a great presentation, and it is much more than I expected before. <laughs> a lot of things. And uh, for all the participants, I invite you to raise your hand if you want to ask questions. Uh, there are some questions in the chat box, but I prioritize anyone who wants to raise your hand for uh, the question. Anyone? Raise your hand if you want to. Uh, Ask the question or want to chat with Tom directly? Uh, well, I'm searching in the chat box. If okay. Also, please feel free to email me as well at, at any point if you have any questions. If you yep, can't yep. think of anything now, ladies, it's fine. Right. If uh, you want to know uh, Tom's email, I'll let you know. Uh, so mm -hmm. the first question in the chat box it is from Hakim Jeharun. He's a friend of mine in my group. Um, it's in Malaysia. It seems there's a gap between the two of the reactor. Is there any reason or factor for that? Because if we can reduce it, the space we could save is high. I mean, probably, uh, is so your presentation, uh, there is a gap between the two. So is there any factor uh, where you need to put that gap and how big that gap should be? So, I mean, if we can, like, narrowing the gap, probably we can uh, save the space quite lots. Yeah, exactly. And it's a good question. And we don't have the answer to that yet. At the moment, between the three systems, we've not noticed a decrease in productivity by the tubes being closer together. But you have to think that the Dutch climate is different from uh, Indonesia. So temperatures in the summertime, maybe we get 30 degrees. In winter, it's 10 degrees. 
and the sun is it's not as high intensity as uh, Indonesia and we also have shading so if the light gets too high that's also very important if you have 250 micromol of light on the system that's fine but if you have a thousand micromol your cells will die so you need to control the light also by shading uh, on the greenhouse by opening and closing shutters so it's not an easy case of saying uh, one particular uh, spacing will will work. It depends on the algae, depends on uh, the country. Uh, okay, I hope that's answered the question. As there is a participant who raised the hand. Uh, yeah, I, I cannot see the name. Who is it? Anyone raise the hand? I want to ask Daryl to talk. I have, I have, question. I have oh, question. Yeah, Yusuf, Yusuf, yeah, please. Okay, uh, Tom, a very impressive uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much for a lot of information, I think. Uh, two things that I want to ask you. First is about the biofouling. <laughs> this is actually also part that I have been worked for, but my background is membrane filtration. Uh, we have also a problem in biofouling, and I think also you show about the biofouling problem on uh, photobioreactors. I don't know how actually your company uh, uh, can uh, prevent the bio falling inside the tube because you you mentioned but I think you have to elaborate more because I think uh, it's very interesting to to prevent this bio falling in uh, photobioreactors in the tube I think and second thing is about the uh, the watering issue uh, you mentioned also about the membrane filtration uh, as uh, the, the method to deliver the the, the, the the spread biomass. Uh, I don't know about the energy uh, consumption. I mean, comparing the results, uh, the biomass, uh, the cost, is it comparable or you have to uh, choose another option for the watering in this, uh, in maybe in either in the lab scale or in the uh, higher scale. I think, I think it's very in interesting to, to know about that. Okay, thank you. I think this is my two questions. Right, yeah, you can you so answer very, that directly. Very good questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so for the biofouling first. So what we do, again, one thing is setting up the systems. So making sure that they're, they're decontaminated. <coughs> so yeah, by heat sterilization, that's one way which works very well. And we also have an in-house cleaning method which we use but essentially it's by using chlorine chlorine is very effective for decontaminating the system and then we use the pigging as well so in between each run and before it we will pig the system so that's that small little sponge which goes through the tubes and that cleans everything very well so after the, the pigging has commenced uh, we then take out the dirty water and that's also a way of uh, reusing a lot of water as well um, because we don't get rid of all of the water we then treat with chlorine then some uh, some other methods and we end up with the clean system. Then as the algae are growing, what we've noticed is if the algae are stressed, so if the light is too high, the temperature is, is too high, uh, or they're nutrient limited, then they become more sticky and the cells adhere more to the glass. And that is when the biofouling occurs. So if the algae are stressed, there's more biofouling. By keeping the algae happy, you're less likely to have biofouling. But the other thing as well, which we have is also the technology. We have a partnership with Shot Glass uh, and Shot produce very good quality glass. If you have plastic tubes, you'll get more fouling. But by having glass, it's a little bit more slippery. I'm not sure, I'm not a material engineer, but for some reason, it works better than plastic. That's why I always choose glass. And it lasts longer. And also you'll find with plastic tubing that uh, the light and the UV especially will degrade the, the, uh, the tube and it will start to go a bit yellowy in color which will block light going to the algae. So always choose glass. And for the second question about uh, the membrane filtration technology, it's a difficult one to answer in terms of energy consumption. I think if you invest in membrane filtration technology or a centrifuge for a one hectare facility, the cost will be quite similar. But the operating cost for membrane filtration technology should be a little bit less. So more along the lines of 0 0.3 kilowatt per meter cube per hour. That's probably what you're looking at. Whereas the centrifuge is one, one kilowatt per meter cube per hour. So in, in terms of, let's say centrifugation is 20% of the cost of the, the cultivation process. So you're saving quite a bit of, of money there. 
But you also have to think not just in terms of the operating cost, but also in terms of labor. Membrane filtration technology, you can just leave it, leave it for 12 hours, and then you have it concentrated. But if you have a centrifuge, the bowl will always get full. So you have to empty it, pack the biomass, and it's very labor intensive. So maybe every 30 minutes, every hour, you have to pack that biomass. Whereas membrane filtration, it's, it's concentrated from maybe 10,000 liters to 100 liters at the end. And then you just pack the biomass there. So it, it's those two things to think about. I hope that's answered the question. Okay. Uh, I have uh, just uh, feedback about that. Did you hear about the forward osmosis uh, system? I think it's quite different than you mentioned before. Because forward normally osmosis. people, uh, forward osmosis, uh, using forward osmosis, you uh, don't need to use uh, high energy for the pump, I think. And then it will be helped for reduce the cost. Mm, that's a good point. Because, yeah, maybe, maybe, I don't know whether you have experience uh, on that. I don't. If but you yeah. could send me some information on that, Yusuf, that would be great. Thanks. Does anybody do that commercially? Is it a big scale no, no. or is it? No, oh, no, it's still, still very very commercially. Scale. Yeah. Yeah. And even, even, yeah. And even Yusuf is doing something related to uh, for osmosis as well. Osmosis, it's like yeah. the repo. You know, the common people use a uh, reverse osmosis. So it is something uh, mm -hmm. uh, counterpart of that reverse osmosis is forward osmosis. Yeah, so uh, I think it's so, used less energy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. All right. I guess you use ultra filtration for the membrane filtration because the cells uh, size for microalgae is in the range of ultra filtration uh, membrane. But when you use for osmosis, you don't need to use a pump. So just use the uh, concentration uh, uh, difference as the press, uh, the, the, the the driving force. Ah. Yeah, that, that's, think, a, that's very important you should bring that up because also for everybody else listening, certain algae, yeah. if they don't have a cell wall and you put them through the pump, the pump will completely break the algae. So exactly. That's very important yes. actually as well if you have this. That's a very interesting technology. Yeah, I think it's very interesting. For, yeah. Okay, thank you for the response. Okay, thank you, uh, Yusuf. Yeah. Do you have any, another question? If you have another question, probably you can ask... Uh, also in the forum. Uh, okay, a small so, small question is about yeah. <laughs> the about the, the by falling. Uh, as you mentioned, you just scrub actually, right? Using spawns. But uh, I think if you just use spawns uh, to to remove by falling, it will grow easily later on. I think uh, no, no, or, no. But be, or, or you combine uh, chlorine and also the the scrubbing. Yeah, you're right. Exactly, used So if you just use the sponge alone. It's a yeah. dirty sponge, so it's, it's, it's not going to be clean. But we yeah. use the sponge to remove the dirty water and the fouling. But then we, we treat it with the chlorine. Um, oh, okay. And then and it's this process which then removes uh, okay. yeah, the, the biofouling and the organic material. Yeah. That's, that's okay, fine. thank you. Yeah, makes sense then. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I think we still keep in touch with Tom after this. Okay. Uh, for all of participants, again, I invite you to raise your hands if you are, if you have any questions that uh, you can ask to Tom directly or have a little discussion in this forum. Uh, all right, while waiting for the participants to raise their hands for question, there is a question in the chat box. Okay, my name is Rio. As I see, a lot of bioreactor shapes are quite unique. And by what I see that scientists or even bioengineers do use tubular shapes of bioreactor. Probably the question, I definitely jump to the question. Is there any uh, probably company or organizations um, that focus on bioreactor design? So they like design what type of bioreactors should be used uh, other than the tubular one? Because almost all uh, bioreactors that you show in this presentation is a type of the tubular one. So is there any company or any organization that focus on the bioreactor design, especially the photo bio, yeah, the photobioreactor yeah, ones? I mean, the thing is, so yeah, open pond systems, there are companies who focus on this. I mean, you will basically dig a hole, uh, put some lining, concrete, and then you build your open pond with a paddle wheel. And that, that works. It, it's quite cheap to invest in, but you always get contamination and all these kind of things. So it's not worth it. But if you want... Other technologies, there are companies out there who will do these flat panel bioreactors. So there's a company in Italy for the green wall panels. But like I say, they foul like crazy. So after, after one month, I would have to then start again 
and not only that, but you have to make the plastic bags yourself. And I don't like the idea of plastic as well, because you just throw it away. It's this single-use plastic. So that's why a lot of companies on the market do tubular reactors, because they are the best. They're high productivity, low fouling, and um, they, they last for a very long time. And also the fact is, I even have a bit of an anecdote. A guy uh, I used to work with, he was uh, working at a height and he dropped a spanner and it, uh, it landed on the glass tube and it didn't break. And that's why Scott is very good quality glass. So if you want reactor designs for the tubular form or in a slightly different configuration, Elgin Synology can do that. We're constantly trying to innovate new bioreactor designs. But if you want an open pond, then we can't offer that technology. Uh, but if you just type in online, you'll find companies who do open ponds or, or some unique design. But I, I, I have worked in the industry for seven years. And honestly, they're the best systems I've worked with at Elgin. Not I'm not a business. Uh, okay, I hope that I'm answering the question. So the next question. Uh, again, uh, please place your hand and uh, we will allow you to totally uh, ask to Tom or have a little discussion in this forum. It doesn't really matter. We still have uh, probably 40 minutes left, so quite enough time. Uh, next question is in the chat box. It, is, it comes from Hanifa. It is about uh, microalgae extraction. As you said, that it is one of the critical points in microalgae, my, microalgae projection, production. So as we know that, uh, the question is more, in a full scale or in industrial scale, how you will get uh, the maximum uh, products uh, in this product, he told about astaxanthin or flucoxanthin, mm -hmm. other than maceration. So there are a lot of uh, way, a method of, of extraction. So in a full scale, what type of extraction probably you prefer to use? Yeah. So. So it depends on a lot of parameters as well. So let, let's assume you've grown your algae, then you harvest them with the, the membrane filtration technology or a centrifuge. You then dry them. It, it's, it's the best way to do it like that. So you, you dewater the cells, then you dry them. Drying is very expensive as a process, but it preserves the quality of the product. Then after drying, it's best to then disrupt the cells through dry milling. It depends on your product, of course, it depends on your algae. So you have a thick cell wall like Nanocoropsis or Corella, Disrupting using dry milling will work very well. Then you need to extract the product of interest. So you have to think as well what solvents you're using. If it's a non-polar uh, compound, then you can use supercritical carbon dioxide alone. But if you have a polar compound, which is uh, EPA or fucosanthin, astaxanthin, then you will need a co-solvent, which might be olive oil or ethanol. So the technology which works is food grade, is supercritical carbon dioxide with ethanol that works very well uh, but then you have to separate the product so if you want to separate your epa or your fucosanthin it becomes very complex and then you'll probably need some other solvent and that's where it's, it's difficult because often the solvents needed are quite toxic and um, so that needs to be overcome it's not clear and that's why at lgm synology we focus more on the biomass with all of the the products so for instance in indonesia it might be better to just have biomass which is rich in all of these products. So focus more on getting lots of astaxanthin or lots of fucosanthin and EPA, and then sell that biomass to somebody else who deals with the extraction. All right, so that's the advice from Tom. Uh, focus on and uh, growing, growing the biomass and the contents of a uh, product of interest uh, rather than extraction. But uh, it, I mean, there's not, not something wrong if we try to extract the uh, product of interest as well, like astaxanthin and fructoxanthin. But as Tom said, that it is quite uh, critical in, in sort of the cost of extraction. Is that correct? Exactly. It's very expensive to invest in the technology itself. And it's a lot of electricity as well to do it. So that's why, yeah, as Wahi says, outsource. Yeah. So the next question, uh, it is about the economic perspective. Uh, I'll read the whole question. 
in the economics perspective, which one more profitable, algae or biofuel, or algae as a food, or like a product, production, the high valuable chemicals, or from the microbiology, which one is more profitable? It's a good question, and that's not so easy to answer, actually, because in terms of simplicity, it's easier just to grow algae for food as a whole product. But you will get more money if you sell the product of interest. But as we discussed before, focus on the growing, grow the algae, dewater it with a centrifuge or membrane filtration, pack the biomass, and then sell that, well, outsource it to a third party, or have some trials done at a university, and then get that product of interest, send out some samples to clients, see what they're willing to pay for it, and see if it's worthwhile to sell the biomass for food or as a nutraceutical. Uh, it, it really will depend upon the customer. I see that um, it's quite easy to grow the, the microalgae in many types of bioreactors. If, if you can use your own bottle, but if your product of interest is only the biomass itself, yeah, uh, the, cost, the, the process will be very low. Uh, if you're using tubular for produ pro uh, producing the microalgae, just for producing the biomass, it will not cover the cost. Uh, so probably if you can like uh, grow a microalgae for a product of interest, for high valuable chemical, it would be better. Uh, last time you talked, you told me that uh, if you probably interested on the biofuel production from microalgae, you should not only doing that for biofuel. You should do uh, it's like doing a lot of things at once. You do biofuel and you do produce uh, other biochemical with the same uh, microalgae culture. So what's your comment about this? Yeah, exactly. So, so biodiesel alone, a lot of experienced people will tell you this, biofuels alone will not work, whether it's biohydrogen, biogas, biodiesel, uh, and especially a lot of places now are going electric anyway. So the idea is to phase away, uh, phase out of, of biodiesel. But if you are going to go down the biodiesel route, then you need to produce a high value product to sell with it. So for instance, Hematococcus produces biodiesel and astaxanthin. So you can sell that astaxanthin as a high value product. And then as the, the waste is the biodiesel, that is possible. And the same as nanochloropsis, you can produce the, uh, the EPA and the biodiesel. But the difficulty is in still the extraction process and, and separation. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, still, we have how many more minutes? How many more minutes do you have? Uh, should be about 20. Yeah, we still got 20 more minutes. If anyone to ask the question, well, Tom's still here. You can ask directly to Tom. You want to have a discussion or you want to know or you want to visit the synarchy. Is it possible to visit, to visit uh, synarchy? I like uh, doing internship for the students, or we want to know how the facility in there. Um, and yeah, actually, that, that would be. It. I can put you in touch if anybody's interested. If they send me an email, and I will uh, forward that on to management, mm -hmm. and then uh, yeah, we, we'll be very happy to receive uh, yeah interns to study at the company for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's. A very good opportunity. Uh, if anyone have interest to visit Chinalge someday, so you can send uh, a message to Tom. Uh, but Tom cannot guarantee that you will be allowed to, to go there, but at least he will try to pass it to the manager. All yeah, right. exactly. That's right. Yes, yeah. so it's easier if you send me a, a message, send me a CV, and then uh, then exactly, as, as like you said, that would be nice. It would be a pleasure to have anybody who would be interested for sure. So another question for me about Sinalki. Um, oh. Do you mainly like a service company who like designing the bioreactor for the third party or you do produce microalgae for your own company? Yes, we do both actually. So the thing is, to demonstrate our technology, we have to be a grower ourselves. We can't just sell systems, which is what other manufacturing companies do. They sell you a system, but they've not even tested it to grow algae. Whereas we, we have, we validated this and we uh, yeah, like so 20 species of algae in our reactors ourselves. And then we're now demonstrating at 30,000 litre scale. So we are a grower. We sell products to the marketplace now. We have two clients. And um, yeah, it, 
we're, we're making a business model on these. That's right, as well as selling the technology. Okay, uh, anyone want to have a question? Any question from the participants? Uh, we're still waiting for the next 10 minutes while we are still here. Uh, or Joseph, you want to continue your discussion about membrane? No, no, I, yeah. I just want actually, to- Actually, Yusuf is an expert in membrane technology. So yeah, it is quite good to have no, him. No, no, <laughs> no, I just tried to, 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 to read your reason uh, a, a book chapter about astaxanthin, but I cannot download for free here. I think if I can get the copy of your book chapter, it's very useful. I think it's very interesting I will, to I will have. Send you that, yeah, yeah this, the, the downstream processing, I think, is very, very interesting for because I think uh, the the yeah, I mean, this one, I think the the, the key for uh, to get the the good product, the end product, I think, for the microalgae, isn't it? Maybe you can just uh, describe, <laughs> just for uh, for a curiosity, this one you mentioned about here about the bioflocculin and also the I think the same or the, the extraction process for azacentin itself. Yeah, so it's so that's, so that's a different different one exactly. Yeah, I will send you the book chapter, but please send me an email or what you can give me your email and then, then sure, I will, sure. I will okay, do that. Okay, fine. Um, yeah. but, but then for your point as well about yeah, the flocculin. So I was I was investigating a lot of different flocculins, and for everybody else as well to know aluminium and iron are commonly used in the wastewater industry and also yeah. dairy, but they're, they're toxic and it's, it's not, uh, it's still constrained by the, the cost of production. So I look, looked into uh, all sorts of bio-based flocculants, so eggshells, uh, chitosan, which is well used. And anyway, mm -hmm. I came across this one, uh, tannic acid. Like I say, it's um, from an invasive acacia tree. You get the tannic acid. It has a quaternary polymerization reaction which forms this uh, tannic acid tan -tan flock and that one works really effectively and uh, yeah I can send you the paper on that as well so I did that for fair dactylum but it can apply to any algae which has a cell wall and it's negatively charged because it is free charge neutralization so the positive what charge, compound is that? Uh, what compound, is that? Uh, compound. It, mm, it's just it's just a derivative of tannic acid that's what it is it's, but the product is called Tanflock, okay. and they sell two types. There's Tanflock 6025 and 8025. But 8025 I found to work better. And it's hard to put it into perspective, but simply by using five milligrams per liter of, of this uh, in one gram per liter of algae, it works very effectively. So you just, you just add it with a pet to your culture, and it flocculates. And, it, and it, it's, normally flocculants can take several hours, but this occurs in 10 minutes, which is quite fascinating. But you have to think about it as well, Yusuf, because if you, yeah, like I say, if, if it's for biofuels, it's not a problem. But for food, you have to be careful because not, not all are considered food grade, shall we say. But if you can, if you're just producing a, a product, it might be okay. So if you produce astaxanthin, it's not an issue in theory. But if you produce the biomass for food, it'd be okay that it's got a flocculant. And that's why you have to use membrane technology or centrifugation. Uh, you mentioned about using chitosan. Yeah, actually, we are in Indonesia. We got a lot of like seafood industry, and we got a lot of like uh, prawn share, uh, a lot of things that waste of that seafood yeah. industry. And I think we can extract that chitosan, and we can use that as, as a biofuel. Yeah, I, I agree, and I think chitosan works very well. The problem is in the West is that it's very expensive to buy chitosan, and the other issue you have to think about if you get the chitosan. You know, what purity is it going to be? And I, I did use that in my studies as well, chitosan from crab shells. But if you, if you extract it, normally you have to use sulfuric acid or hydrochloric acid. So it's not the cleanest of processes. That's always the problem. It's like you need something quite harsh to extract it. But it is possible, and it, it is worth an investigation. A lot of people have done work on this area. Yeah, because we've got a lot of waste on that seafood industry. So it is just, rather than just dumping that waste, probably we can use that with yeah, yeah. some investigation probably you can use that later I, in the future or i yeah. completely agree as well with you because i worked in a, a seafood shack as well and i was in the seafood processing industry and you're just seeing all of this waste oyster shells and mussels and it just goes to a landfill site so it's a shame you can't then process it into something of interest and that's the whole part about the circular economy you know what do you have here is a waste source that you can then use as something else and, and that's the whole part of it so i think it's an interesting idea with the kind of stuff for sure Right. Uh, anyone? Any more question? 
should I close the talk if there is no more question? We still have nine minutes. So it's, yeah, nine minutes, I think it's a valuable time if anyone wants to have a question. One question? I was gonna ask as well, uh, uh, Yusuf, when is your uh, uh, technology gonna go commercial? We would like to use that here at Elgin <laughs> Synology. The, uh, oh, the very nice, yes. technology. Yeah, uh, very yeah, nice, very nice, yeah. We, oh, we, we can try that. for us in the Synology, I think it's also possible. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We'll be, we'll sell be the, yeah, I can sell the uh, I can send the paper and then you can see and then whether possible to to use this uh, technology. I think it's very yeah. useful. I think yeah 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 and uh, yeah I will send you the paper uh, from Yusuf and I'm waiting for your paper as well. But yeah, ask, ask something I'm not sure mm -hmm. uh, because I was try to I, I tried to download it as well, but I, I couldn't do that. The one that you did with I think Israeli company or it's a university. I'm not yeah, really so it's sure. a company. Exactly. So they're actually doing astaxanthin production in Israel. So the CEO of uh, Breville, um, Jonathan Golan, he's he's actually producing astaxanthin now. Um, so uh, yeah, he's, it's very interesting also to contact him. So you said probably you need to do more research on that board osmosis. Probably it will be used by Tom's company. So yeah, oh. we really need <laughs> this technology. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Sometimes right. you know, sometimes the constraint in Indonesia is about uh, the funding for the research that's because yeah, it's quite it's quite 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 difficult. Sometimes you've got funding, but it's not that much. So, but I hope that's not the burden. So we need to do anything we can do, even with uh, the available resource. No need to have like a very expensive resource for doing that or to, to start that. Uh, all right, so Anyway, hey, there is one more uh, question in the text box. You can read. Uh, All right. right. Yeah. Can I just read the question rather than paraphrasing it? Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. You've been mentioned. Oh, you want to read the question by yourself? <laughs> okay. You've been mentioned about auto respiration caused by low intensity light, especially during the night, uh, that reaches the biomass production. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I've read that hetero through thickly low intensity can actually increase biomass because cells focus on using energy for growth rather than for photosynthesis. Uh, so I tried in the lab to grow cells in total darkness and got pretty interesting biomass. So I think that there is potential for microalgae to be grown in total darkness and it can reduce production cost because we do need large large areas for open pond, probably it is for uh, if you're growing it indoor, maybe, I'm not really sure with the question. Yeah, no, no, the, the, question, the, question. Question, the question is good, but uh, so what you have to think, there's three modes of cultivation, phototrophic, mixotrophic, and heterotrophic. So phototrophic is only using light and carbon dioxide, inorganic carbon. If you use organic carbon, <laughs> then that's mixotrophy and heterotrophy. So in normal phototrophic production with no organic carbon, then you get photorespiration in the dark because they have no carbon source to utilize in the dark. But with mixotrophy, they use the light, inorganic carbon and organic carbon, such as glucose, glycerol, acetate. And in heterotrophy, you have no light and they metabolize that carbon uh, substrate in the dark. So yes, you can achieve much higher uh, uh, Productivities, but the negative factor about the uh, the organic carbon source is that you also get more contamination because bacteria, fungi, they're going to be using that and they grow much faster. If you think a microalgae has a doubling time in phototrophy of 24 to 48 hours, E. coli can double in around one to two hours, and the yeast is uh, sorry in 20 minutes, and the yeast is about one to two hours. So your your yeast, your bacteria, your fungi will outgrow your algae. And not all algae can metabolize organic carbon substrates. So phenactylone can't use glucose or acetate. It's really glycerol. So that depends as well. You're always trying to look at this microbial consortia. And normally your algae is not alone. You can't have an axemic culture of algae in a, in a commercial process. So as your algae is growing, you've also got these friends and these foes, some good bacteria, some bad bacteria. But if you have a negative condition or too much carbon, then those negative bacteria start to uh, outcompete your algae. So just to summarize as well, photorespiration uh, occurs in phototrophic cultivation. 
without organic carbon. But heterotrophy is great, yes, but it produces, it's relying on organic carbon, but you have to control the contamination. So, uh, yeah, Patika Pitriana, probably if you can confirm, uh, did you do it in heterotrophic or in autotrophic? If you can discuss with Tom directly, we still have like four more minutes. Patika, do you want to discuss it directly to Tom? It would be great if you can directly discuss it to Tom. Did you do it in autotrophic or heterotrophic? Yeah, because I'd be really interested in what you what you did. Yeah, what what carbon source did you use? Um, you know, and what results did you have? Yeah, because uh, I read some publication that they do like um, not twelve hours. It's like eighteen hours in light and about eight hours in darkness. Uh, the microalgae and it is autotrophic as well, using carbon dioxide. It's not heterotrophic. I um I haven't tried a lot of Microalgal, al microalgal species, mm -hmm. uh, what I've done is probably with Torella vulgaris and nanocorrhosis and the spiroline. I don't know with other types of microalgae. Probably it depends on uh, like the condition uh, you go in the it, microalgae. It, it, it does as well because it also depends on your light path as well. So algae do need the dark to repair the photosynthetic apparatus. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if you just give them light all the time, they become stressed, it's photo inhibited and will die. So you need to have that balance. But if your tube length, is longer so here we have uh, 65 millimeter diameter tubes so naturally you have at higher densities algae shading each other so if you supply continuous light they're still having some dark time but if you only have a, a 10 millimeter tube and you supply the same light then they're actually receiving more light per cell so that is it's yeah it's not as simple as yeah you provide continuous light in one tube and one another tube you have to depend upon your system your algae some like more light some don't so there's always things to think about. All right, I think uh, we still have two minutes left. Uh, should we close the talk now? Uh, anyone want to ask the question? All right. Uh, okay, Tom, for the last statement, do you want to have to give like a uh, like, uh, closing statement before we uh, finish the talk? Yeah, sure. Just to say that, um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm happy to help. And if anybody has a question or an email they don't want to say here, they want to message me about it, I'm very happy to answer that. And the fact is that anybody can grow microalgae. And I truly do believe that microalgae is the future and it is a sustainable source to, of products of interest. And that's why I've been in the industry for seven years. I, I love what I do. I love going to work. And um, yeah, I hope you all feel so passionate and inspired about it. And I hope I will see some of you start your own businesses. Because I, I looked actually on the internet and there was a company in Indonesia, which was a microalgae business, which started a few years ago. What kind of company? You mentioned it, the name. It's called uh, PT Evergen Resources. Never heard about that. Yusuf, have you heard about that company? Sorry, you can uh, repeat. Can you repeat it? Yeah, of course. It's called P P PT Evergen yeah, Resources. PT. Let me let me just quickly share my screen with yeah, you yeah, all, yeah, so okay, you can fine. you can take a picture. Or uh, so let's go to that one. That one. And they're actually producing astaxanthin. Are they still doing the business? Or it is just a few years ago. Oh, so has Evergreen Evergen Resource. Oh, Evergen Resources in, in, in Kindle, Central Java. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's maybe one to keep an eye on. And they have a brand called Astalux, which is Astalux. They also produce with high matter cookers as well. Food exactly. Yeah. yeah. So probably you need to contact them if they're doing the business. Uh, probably it will be very interesting to have a research with them. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, so I'm recommend. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. 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 So yeah. like I said, anyone. Uh, Feel free to, to yeah, ask any questions by email, no problem. So thank you very much for the invitation, all, and uh, it's a, a pleasure to be here. No worries, yeah, no worries. Yeah, right. So yeah, thank you very much, Tom, and thank you very much for all the participants who have joined in our talk today. And we still have uh, many talks uh, this week, uh, and we will share to you that talk as well.
and we have uh, finished the discussion about the microalgae, but I, I hope it's not the end of uh, our communication, it's not the end of uh, our collaboration. Uh, I hope it is the beginning of our research collaboration in the future. Uh, and Tom have, has mentioned that anyone probably interested on like visiting uh, the Sinalga, say, Sinalga site, probably you can contact Tom. If you don't have Tom's uh, contact number or email, probably you can you can ask me. Uh, is, is it okay to share your email address? Yeah, that's no problem. You can share my email address. That's fine. All right, I, I, I can share uh, Tom's email address. Probably you need to contact the, the organizer, then I will send it to you. And that's it for today. Uh, thank you for all participants. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, it's actually much more what I expected uh, with <laughs> the thing that you know that most academia just just doing something in the lab, but uh, it's like you have a huge industrial experience and, and you have shown us the real world microalgae production, not only in the labs. So it is really, really good. I hope uh, we can continue that in the future. I hope that's it. Uh, so I recently picked in the MC. Thank you, well, Tom, by the way. Thank you. Can you speak much. Netherlands already? <laughs> Thank you, well. Oh, sorry? Thank you, uh, yeah. well. Top, top, yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's like the Hill Hood, Netherlands. Yeah. Uh, Hill Hood, yeah. Uh, cleaner, cleaner Netherlands. Yeah, yeah okay. Thank you. <laughs> his, his girlfriend is Portuguese, uh, yeah. Probably, oh, okay. Yeah, probably he's he's a, learned, you should learn Netherlands. Learned, yeah, speak, ah, speak fala, Portuguese. Fala Portuguese. Well. Uh, minha namorada é Portuguese. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah, we, we, okay, thank we actually, you very much. Yeah, yeah. We're actually waiting for you to come to Indonesia next year after the pandemic finished. Just do you happy scuba diving, traveling, uh, a lot of things? It would be my yeah. pleasure. I would really, yeah, actually, that's my plan as well. Same thing next year, Operation Wallacea, and I will definitely come to visit for sure. Yeah. All right. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you thank very much. Answer. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you very much. Everybody have a great uh, evening there. Yeah. Okay. Fine okay, yeah. yeah. and Do. Do. Thank you so much for Dr. Thomas Butler for sharing. And thank you to Dr. Wahyu Ranto for moderating the session. For all participants, don't forget to fill in the attendance form that will be given in the comment section. So your attendance will be recorded by us for the certificate. Attendance form will be open until 6 p.m. Unfortunately, we're going to end the session soon. But before we end the guest lecture, let's take a picture together. For OC, you can please take the picture for us. For all participants, please turn on your camera. Okay, in the countdown of three, say cheers. One, two, three. Again, one, two, three. Okay, one more. One, two, three. All right. I would like to say thank you to all participants and guests for coming today. We are sorry for any mistakes or trouble in this event. We hope you enjoy the session with us. It's nice, it's nice to miss you all here. To all participants, don't forget to join Bioprocess Engineering Week next day. See you next time. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Have a good day, everyone. Stay healthy. So, now we can leave. Yeah. Terima kasih semuanya. Thank you, everyone. Terima kasih mungkin bisa di end. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Recording stopped.